Welcome back to Have You Heard? I am Angela from Broadhead Memorial Public Library and we are continuing to read Charlotte's Web by E.B. White and Pictures by Garth Williams. Before we start, we just want to give a thank you to Harper and Row Publishers and Scholastic for allowing us to share this story with you. All right, well, when we left off yesterday, the uh, Arables and Zuckermans had just left to take Wilbur to the fair and Templeton and Charlotte are hiding in the crate with him. So let's find out what happens next. Chapter 17, Uncle. When they pulled into the fairgrounds, they could hear music and see the Ferris wheel turning in the sky. They could smell the dust of the racetrack where the sprinkling cart had moistened it. And they could smell hamburgers frying and see, see balloons aloft. They could hear sheep blading in their pens. An enormous voice over the loudspeaker said, Attention, please. Will the owner of a Pontiac car license plate H2439 please move your car away from the fireworks shed? Can I have some money? asked Fern. Can I too? asked Avery. I'm going to win a doll by spinning a wheel and it will stop at the right number, said Fern. I'm going to steer a jet plane and make it bump into another. Can I have a balloon? asked Fern. Can I have a frozen custard and a cheeseburger and some raspberry soda pop? asked Avery. You children be quiet till we get the pig unloaded, said Mrs. Arable. Let's let the children go off by themselves, suggested Mr. Arable. The fair only comes once a year. Mr. Arable gave Fern two quarters and two dimes. He gave Avery five dimes and four nickels. Now, run along, he said, and remember, the money has to last all day. Don't spend it all the first few minutes. And be back here at the truck at noontime so we can all have lunch together. And don't eat a lot of stuff that's going to make you sick to your stomachs. And if you go on those swings, said Mrs. Arable, you hang on tight. You hang on very tight. You hear me? And don't get lost, said Mrs. Zuckerman. And don't get dirty. And don't get overheated, said their mothers. Watch out for pickpockets, cautioned their father. And don't cra cross the racetrack when the horses are coming, cried Mrs. Zuckerman. The children grabbed each other by the hand and danced off in the direction of the merry-go-round, for the wonderful music and the wonderful adventure and the wonderful excitement into the wonderful midway where they were would be where there would be no parents to guard them and guide them and where they could be happy and free to do as they pleased mrs arable stood quietly and watched them go then she sighed she blew her nose do you really think it's all right she asked well they've got to grow up sometime said mr arable and a fair is a good place to start i guess while Wilbur was being unloaded and taken out of his crate and into his new pig pen, crowds gathered to watch. They stared at the sign, Zuckerman's Famous Pig. Wilbur stared back and tried to look extra good. He was pleased with his new home. The pen was grassy and it was shaded from the sun by the shed roof. Charlotte watched her chance, scrambled out of the crate and climbed a post to the underside of the roof. Nobody noticed her. Templeton, not wishing to come out in broad daylight, stayed quiet under the straw at the bottom of the crate. Mr. Zuckerman poured some skim milk into Wilbur's trough, pitched clean straw into his pen, and then he and Mrs. Zuckerman and the arables walked away toward the cattle barn to look at purebred cows and to see the sights. Mr. Zuckerman particularly wanted to look at tractors. Mrs. Zuckerman wanted to see a deep freeze. Lurby wandered off by himself, hoping to meet friends and have some fun on the midway. As soon as the people were gone, Charlotte spoke to Wilbur. It's a good thing I, you can't see what I see, she said. What do you see, asked Wilbur. There's a pig in the next pen, and he's enormous. I'm afraid he's much bigger than you are. Maybe he's older than I am and has had more time to grow, suggested Wilbur. Tears began to come to his eyes. I'll drop down and have a closer look, Charlotte said. Then she crawled along a beam till she was directly over the pen. She let herself down on a drag line until she hung in the air just in front of the big pig's snout. May I have your name? she asked politely. The pig stared at her. No name, he said in a big hearty voice. Just call me uncle. 
Very well, uncle, replied Charlotte. What is the date of your birth? Are you a spring pig? Sure I am a spring pig, replied uncle. What did you think I was, a spring chicken? Ha ha, that's a good one, eh, sister? Mildly funny, said Charlotte. I've heard funnier ones, though. Glad to have met you, and now I must be going. She ascended slowly and returned to Wilbur's pen. He claims to be a spring pig, reported Charlotte, and perhaps he is. One thing is certain, he has a most unattractive personality. He's too familiar, too nosy. He cracks weak jokes. Also, he's not anywhere near as clean as you are, nor as pleasant. I took quite a dislike to him in our brief interview. He's going to be a hard pig to beat, though, Wilbur, on account of his size. And wait, but with... He's going to be a hard pig to beat, though, Wilbur, on account of his size and weight. But with me helping you, it can be done. When are you going to spin a web, asked Wilbur. This afternoon late, if I'm not too tired, said Charlotte. The least things tire me these days. I don't seem to have the energy I once had. My age, I guess. Wilbur looked at his friend. She looked rather, rather swollen and she seemed listless. I'm awfully sorry to hear that you're feeling poorly, Charlotte, he said. Perhaps if you spin a web and catch a couple of flies, you'll feel better. Perhaps, she said wearily, but I feel like the end of a long day. Clinging upside down to the ceiling, she settled down for a nap, leaving Wilbur very much worried. All morning, dozens of people wandered past Wilbur's pen. Dozens and dozens of strangers stopped to stare at him and to admire his silky white coat, his curly tail, his kind and radiant expression. Then they would move on to the next pig pen where a bigger pig laid. Wilbur heard several people make favorable remarks about Uncle's great size. He couldn't help, help overhear these remarks, and he couldn't help worrying. And now with Charlotte not feeling well, he thought, oh dear. All morning Templeton slept quietly under the straw. The day grew fiercely hot. At noon the Zuckermans and the Arables returned to the pig pen. Then, a few minutes later, Fern and Avery showed up. Fern had a monkey doll in her arms and was eating Cracker Jack. Avery had a balloon tied to his ear and was chewing a candied apple. The children were hot and dirty. Isn't it hot, said Mrs. Zuckerman. It's terribly hot, said Mrs. Arable, fanning herself with an advertisement of a deep freeze. One by one, they climbed in the truck and opened lunch boxes. The sun beat down on everything. Nobody seemed hungry. When are the judges going to decide about Wilbur? asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Not till tomorrow, said Mr. Zuckerman. Lurvy appeared, carrying an Indian blanket that he had won. That's just what I need, Avery said. A blanket. Of course it is, replied Lurvy, and he spread the blanket across the sideboards of the truck so that it was like a little tent. The children sat in the shade under the blanket and felt better. After lunch, they stretched out and fell asleep. Chapter 18, The Cool of the Evening In the cool of the evening, when shadows darkened the fairgrounds, Templeton crept out of the crate and looked around. Wilbur lay asleep in the straw. Charlotte was building a web. Templeton's keen nose detected many fine smells in the air. The rat was hungry and thirsty. He decided to go exploring. Without saying anything to anybody, he started off. Bring me back a word, Charlotte called after him. I shall be writing tonight for the last time. The rat mumbled something for himself and disappeared into the shadows. He did not like being treated like a messenger boy. After the heat of the day, the evening came as welcome relief to all. The Ferris wheel was lighted now. It went around and around in the sky and seemed twice as high by day. There were lights on the midway and you could hear the cackle of the gambling machines and the music of the merry-go-round and the voice of the man at the Beano booth calling numbers. Children felt refreshed after their nap. Fern met her friend Henry Fussy and he invited her to ride with him in the Ferris wheel. He even bought a ticket for her so it didn't cost her anything. When Mrs. Arable happened to look up into the starry sky and saw her little daughter sitting with Henry Fussy and going higher and higher into the air and saw how happy Fern looked, she just shook her head. My, my, she said, Henry Fussy, think of that. Templeton kept out of sight. In the tall grass behind the cattle barn, he fo found folded newspaper. Inside it were leftovers from somebody's lunch, a deviled ham sandwich, a piece of Swiss cheese, 
part of a hard-boiled egg and a core of a wormy apple. The rat crawled in and ate everything. Then he tore a word out of the paper, rolled it up, and star started back to Wilbur's pen. Charlotte had her web almost finished when Templeton returned carrying the newspaper clipping. She had left a space in the middle of the web. At this hour, no people were around the pig pen, so the rat and the spider and the pig were by themselves. I hope you brought a good one, Charlotte said. It's the last word I shall ever write. Here, said Templeton, unrolling the paper. What does it say? asked Charlotte. You'll have to read it to me. It says humble, replied the rat. Humble, said Charlotte. Humble has two meanings. It means not proud, and it means near the ground. That's Wilbur all over. He's not proud, and he's near the ground. Well, I hope you're satisfied, sneered the rat. I'm not going to spend all my time fetching and carrying. I came to this fair to enjoy myself, not to deliver papers. You've been very helpful, Charlotte said. Run along if you want to see more of the fair. The rat grinned. I'm going to make a night of it, he said. The old sheep was right. This fair is a rat's paradise. What eating and what drinking and everywhere good hiding and good hunting. Bye-bye, my humble Wilbur. Fare thee well, Charlotte, you old schemer. This will be a night to remember in a rat's life. He vanished into the shadows. Charlotte went back to work. It was quite dark now. In the distance, fireworks began going off, rockets scattering fiery balls into the sky. By the time the Arables and Zuckermans and Lurvy returned from the grandstand, Charlotte had finished her web. The word humble was woven neatly in the center. Nobody noticed in the darkness. Everyone was tired and happy. Fern and Avery climbed in the truck and lay down. They pulled the Indian blanket over them. Lurvy gave Wilbur a forkful of fresh straw. Mr. Arable patted him. Time for us to go home, he said to the pig. See you tomorrow. The grown-ups climbed slowly into the truck, and Wilbur heard the engine start, and then he heard the truck moving away at low speed. He would have felt lonely and homesick had Charlotte not been with him. He never felt lonely when she was near. In the distance, he could still hear the music of the merry-go-round. As he was dropping off to sleep, he spoke to Charlotte. Sing me that song again about the dung in the dark, he begged. Not tonight, she said in a low voice. I'm too tired. Her voice didn't seem to come from her web. Where are you? asked Wilbur. I can't see you. Are you in your web? I'm back here, she answered, up in this back corner. Why aren't you on your web? asked Wilbur. You're almost nev you almost never leave your web. I left it tonight, she said. Wilbur closed her eyes. Charlotte, he said, after a while, do you really think Zuckerman will let me live and not kill me when the cold weather comes? Do you really think so? Of course, said Charlotte. You are a famous pig, and you are a good pig. Tomorrow you will probably win a prize. The whole world will hear about you. Zuckerman will be proud and happy to own such a pig. You have nothing to fear, Wilbur. Nothing to worry about. Maybe you'll live forever. Who knows? And now, go to sleep. For a while there was no sound. Then Wilbur's voice. What are you doing up there, Charlotte? Oh, making something, she said. Making something as usual. Is it something for me? asked Wilbur. No, said Charlotte. It's something for me. For a change. Please tell me what it is, begged Wilbur. I'll tell you in the morning, she said. When the first light comes into the sky and the sparrows stir and the cows rattle their chains, when the rooster crows and the stars fade, when the early cars whisper along the highway, you'll look up here and I'll show you something. I'll show you my masterpiece. Before she finished the sentence, Wilbur was asleep. She could tell by the sound of his breathing that he was sleeping peacefully, deep in the straw. Miles away the air, at the Arable's house, the men sat around the kitchen table eating a dish of canned peaches and talking over the events of the day. Upstairs, Avery was already in bed asleep. Mrs. Arable was tucking Fern into bed. Did you have a good time at the fair? She asked as she kissed her daughter. Fern nodded. I had the best time I've ha ever had anywhere or at any time in my whole life. Well, said Mrs. Arable, isn't that nice? Chapter 19, The Egg Sack Next morning, when the first light came into the sky and the sparrows stirred in the trees, when the cows rattled their chains and the rooster crowed and the early automobiles went whispering along the, world, the road, Wilbur awoke and looked for Charlotte. He saw her up overhead in the corner near the back of his pen. She was very quiet. 
Her eight legs were spread wide. She seemed to have shrunk during the night. Next to her, attached to the ceiling, Wilbur saw a curious object. It was sort of it was a sort of sack or cocoon. It was peach colored and it looked as though it were made of cotton candy. Are you awake, Charlotte? he said softly. Yes, came an answer. What is that nifty little thing? Did you make it? I did indeed, replied Charlotte in a weak voice. Is it a plaything? Plaything? I should say not. It's my egg sack, my magnum opus. I don't know what a magnum opus is, said Wilbur. It's Latin, explained Charlotte. It means great work. This egg sack is my great work, the finest thing I've ever made. What's inside? asked Wilbur. Eggs? Five hundred and fourteen of them, she replied. Five hundred and fourteen, said Wilbur. You're kidding. No, I'm not. I counted them. I got I got started counting, so I kept on, just keeping my mind occupied. It's a perfectly beautiful egg sack, said Wilbur, feeling as happy as though he had constructed it himself. Yes, it is pretty, replied Charlotte, patting the sack with her two front legs. Anyway, I can guarantee that it's strong. It's made out of the toughest material I have. It's also waterproof. The eggs are inside and will be warm and dry. Charlotte, said Wilbur dreamily, are you really going to have 514 children? If nothing else happens, yes, she said. Of course, they won't show till next spring. Wilbur noticed that Charlotte's voice sounded sad. What makes you sound so downhearted? I should think you'd be terribly happy about this. Oh, I don't, oh, don't pay attention to me, said Charlotte. I just don't have much pep anymore. I guess I feel sad because I won't ever see my children. What do you mean you won't see your children? Of course you will. We'll all see them. It's going to be simply wonderful next spring in the barn cellar with 514 spider babies running around all over the place. And the geese will have new set of goslings and the sheep will have new lambs. Maybe, said Charlotte quietly. However, I have a feeling I'm not going to see the result of last night's efforts. I don't feel good at all. I think I'm languishing to tell you the truth. Wilbur didn't understand the word languish, and he hated to bother Charlotte by asking her to explain, but he was so worried he felt he had to ask. What does languishing mean? It means I'm slowing up, feeling my age. I'm not young anymore, Wilbur, but I don't, don't want you to worry about me. This is your big day today. Look at my web. Doesn't it show up well with the dew on it? Charlotte's web never looked more beautiful than it looked this morning. Each strand held dozens of bright drops in the early morning dew. The light from the east struck it and made it, a, it, it all plain and clear. It was a perfect piece of designing and building. In another hour or two, a steady stream of people would pass by admiring it and reading it and looking at Wilbur and marveling at the miracle. As Wilbur was studying the web, a pair of whiskers and a sharp face appeared. Slowly, Templeton dragged himself across the pen and threw himself down in the corner. I'm back he said in a husky voice. What a night! The rat was swollen to twice his normal size. His stomach was as big around as a jelly jar. What a night, he repeated hoarsely. What feasting and carousing! A real gorge! I must have eaten the remains of thirty lunches. Never have I seen such leavings, and everything well ripened and seasoned with the passage of time and the heat of day. Oh, it was rich, my friends, rich! You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Charlotte in disgust. You, it would serve you right if you had an acute attack of indigestion. Don't worry about my stomach, snarled Templeton. It, can't, it can handle anything. And by the way, I've got some bad news. As I came past the pig, door, the pig next door, I noticed the one that calls himself Uncle. I noticed a blue tag on the front of his pen. That means he has won first prize. I guess you're licked, Wilbur. You might as well relax. Nobody's going to hang any metal on you. Furthermore, I wouldn't be surprised if Zuckerman changes his mind about you. Wait till he gets hankering for some fresh pork and some smoked ham and some crisp bacon. He'll take a knife to you, my boy. Be still, Templeton, said Charlotte. You're too stuffed and bloated to know what you're saying. Don't pay any attention to him, Wilbur. Wilbur tried not to think about what the rat had just said. He decided to change the subject. Templeton, said Wilbur, if you weren't so dopey, you would have noticed that Charlotte has made an egg sack. She is going to become a mother. 
For your information, there are 514 eggs in that peachy little sack. Is this true? asked the rat, eyeing the sack suspiciously. Yes, it's true, sighed Charlotte. Congratulations, murmured Templeton. This has been a night. He closed his eyes, put some straw over himself, and dropped off into a deep sleep. Wilbur and Charlotte were glad to be rid of him for a while. At nine o'clock, Mr. Arable's truck rolled into the fairgrounds and came to a stop at Wilbur's pen. Everybody climbed out. Look, cried Fern, look at Charlotte's web. Look what it says. The grown-ups and the children joined hands and stood there studying the new sign. Humble, said Mr. Zuckerman. Now isn't that just the word for Wilbur? Everyone rejoiced to find that the miracle of the web had been repeated. Wilbur gazed up lovingly into their faces. He looked very humble and grateful. Fern winked at Charlotte. Lurvy soon got busy. He poured a bucket of warm slops into the trough, and while Wilbur ate his, bro his breakfast, Lurvy scratched him gently with a smooth stick. Wait a minute, cried Avery. Look at this. He pointed to the blue tag on Uncle's pen. This pig has won first prize already. The Zuckermans and the Arables stared at the tag. Mrs. Zuckerman began to cry. Nobody said a word. They just stared at the tag. Then they stared at Uncle. Then they stared at the tag again. Lurvy looked out an enormous handkerchief and blew his nose very loud. So loud, in fact, that the noise was heard by stable boys over at the horse barn. Can I have some money, asked Fern. I want to go out on the midway. You stay right where you are, said her mother. Tears came to Fern's eyes. What's everybody crying about, asked Mr. Zuckerman. Let's get busy. Edith, bring the buttermilk. Mrs. Zuckerman wiped her eyes with a handkerchief. She went to the truck and came back with a gallon jar of buttermilk. Bath time, said Mr. Zuckerman cheerfully. He and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery climbed into Wilbur's pen. Avery slowly poured buttermilk on Wilbur's head and back, and as it trickled down his sides and cheeks, Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman rubbed it into his hair and skin. Passerby stopped by to watch. Pretty soon, quite a crowd had gathered. Wilbur grew beautifully white and smooth. The morning sun shone through his pink ears. He isn't as big as the pig next door, remarked one bystander, but he's cleaner. That's what I like. So do I, said another man. He's humble, too, said a woman reading the sign on the web. Everybody who visited the pig pen had a good word to say about Wilbur. Everyone admired the web, and of course, nobody noticed Charlotte. Suddenly, a voice was heard on the loudspeaker. Attention, please, it said. Will Mr. Homer Zuckerman bring his famous pig to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand? A special award will be made there in 20 minutes. Everyone is invited to attend. Crate your pig, please, Mr. Zuckerman, and report to the judge's booth promptly. For a moment after this announcement, the Arables and the Zuckermans were unable to speak or move. Then Avery picked up a handful of straw and threw it high in the air and gave a loud yell. The straw fluttered down like confetti into Fern's hair. Mr. Zuckerman hugged Mrs. Zuckerman. Mr. Arable kissed Mrs. Arable. Avery kissed Wilbur. Lurvy shook hands with everybody. Fern hugged her mother. Avery hugged Fern. Mrs. Arable hugged Mrs. Zuckerman. Up overhead in the shadows of the ceiling, Charlotte crouched unseen, her front legs encircling her egg sack. Her heart was not beating as strongly as usual, and she felt very weary, weary and old. But she was sure at last that she had saved Wilbur's life, and she felt peaceful and contented. "'We have no time to lose,' shouted Mr. Zuckerman. "'Lurvy, help with the crate.' "'Can I have some money?' asked Fern. "'You wait,' said Mrs. Arable. "'Can't you see everybody is busy?' "'Put that empty buttermilk jar into the truck,' commanded Mr. Arable. Avery grabbed the jar and rushed to the truck. Does my hair look all right? asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Looks fine, snapped Mr. Zuckerman, as he and Lurvy set the crate down in front of Wilbur. You didn't even look at my hair, said Mrs. Zuckerman. You're all right, Edith, said Mrs. Arable. Just keep calm. Templeton, asleep in the straw, heard the commotion and awoke. He didn't know exactly what was going on, but when he saw the men shoving Wilbur into the crate, he made up his mind to go along. He watched his his chance when no one was looking and he crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw at the bottom all ready boys cried mr zuckerman let's go he and mr arable and lurvy and avery grabbed the crate and boosted it over the side of the pen and up into the trunk up into the truck fern jumped aboard 
and sat on top of the crate. She still had straw in her hair and looked very pretty and excited. Mr. Arable started the motor. Everyone climbed in, and off they drove to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand. As they passed the Ferris wheel, Fern gazed up and, and, it, and she wished she were in the topmost car with Henry Fussy at her side. Chapter 20, The Hour of Triumph. Special announcement, said the loudspeaker in a pompous voice. The management of the fair takes great pleasure in presenting Mr. Homer L. Zucker and his famous pig. The truck bearing this extraordinary animal is now approaching the infield. Kindly stand back and give the truck room to proceed. In a few moments, the pig will be unloaded in a special judging ring in front of the grandstand where a special award will be made. Will the crowd please make way and let the truck pass? Thank you. Wilbur trembled when he heard this speech. He felt happy but dizzy. The truck crept along slowly in low speed. Crowds of people surrounded it, and Mr. Arable had to drive very carefully in order not to run over anyone. At last he managed to reach the judge's stand. Avery jumped out and lowered the tailgate. I'm scared to death, whispered Mrs. Zuckerman. Hundreds of people looking at us. Cheer up, replied Mrs. Arable. This is fun. Unload your pig, please, said the loudspeaker. All together now, boys, said Mr. Zuckerman. Several men stepped forward from the crowd to help lift the crate. Avery was the busiest helper of all. Tuck your shirt in, Avery, cried Mrs. Zuckerman, and tighten your belt. Your pants are coming down. Can't you see I'm busy, replied Avery in disgust. Look, cried Fern, pointing. There's Henry. Don't shout, said Fern. Fern, said her mother, and don't point. Can't I please have some money, asked Fern. Henry invited me to go on the Ferris wheel again, only I don't think he has any money left. He ran out of money. Mrs. Arable opened her handbag. Here, she said. Here's 40 cents. Now don't get lost, and be back at our regular meeting place by the pig pen very soon. Fern raced off, ducking and dodging through the crowd in search of Henry. The Zuckerman pig is now being taken from his crate boomed the loud voice of the loudspeaker. Stand by for an announcement. Templeton crouched under the straw at the bottom of the crate. What a lot of nonsense, he muttered. What a lot of fuss about nothing. Over in the pig pen, silent and alone, Charlotte rested. Her two front legs embraced the sack. Charlotte could hear everything that was said on the loudspeaker. The words gave her courage. This was her hour of triumph. As Wilbur came out of the crate, the crowd clapped and cheered. Mr. Zuckerman took off his cap and bowed. Lurvy pulled his big handkerchief from his pocket and wiped sweat from the back of his neck. Avery knelt in the dirt by Wilbur's side, busily stroking him and showing off. Mrs. Zuckerman and Mrs. Arable stood on the running board of the truck. Ladies and gentlemen, said the loudspeaker, we now present Mr. Homer L. Zuckerman's distinguished pig, the fame of this unique animal has spread to the far corners of the earth, attracting many valuable tourists to our great state. Many of you will recall that never-to-be-forgotten day last summer when the writing appeared mysteriously in the spider's web in Mr. Zuckerman's barn, calling attention to all of, all and sundry to the fact that this pig was completely out of the ordinary. This miracle has never been fully explained, although learned men have visited the Zuckerman pig pen to study and observe the phenomenon. In the last analysis, we simply know that we are dealing with supernatural forces here, and we should all feel proud and grateful. In the words of the Spider's Web, ladies and gentlemen, this is some pig. Wilbur blushed. He stood perfectly still and tried to look his best. This magnificent animal, continued the loudspeaker, is truly terrific. Look at him, ladies and gentlemen. Note the smoothness and whiteness of the coat. Observe the spotless skin, the healthy pink glow of ears and snout. It's the buttermilk, whispered Mrs. Arable to Mrs. Zuckerman. Note the general radiance of this animal. Then remember the day when the word radiant appeared clearly on the web. Whence came this mysterious writing? Not from the spider, we can arrest assured of that. Spiders are very clever at weaving their webs, but needless to say, spiders cannot write. Oh, they can't, can't they? murmured Charlotte to herself. Ladies and gentlemen, continued the loudspeaker, 
I must take not take any more of your valuable time. On behalf of the governors of the fair, I have an honor of awarding a special prize of $25 to Mr. Zuckerman, together with a handsome bronze medal suitably engraved in token of our appreciation of the part played by this pig, this radiant, this terrific, this humble pig in attracting so many visitors to our great fair. Wilbur had had been feeling dizzier and dizzier through this long complimentary speech. When he heard the crowd begin to cheer and clap again, he suddenly fainted away. His legs collapsed, his mind went blank, and he fell to the ground unconscious. What's wrong? asked the loudspeaker. What's going on, Zuckerman? What's the trouble with your pig? Avery was kneeling by Wilbur's head, stroking him. Mr. Zuckerman was dancing about, fanning him with his cap. He's all right, cried Mr. Zuckerman. He gets these spells. He's modest and da- can't stand praise. Well, we can't give a prize to a dead pig, said the loudspeaker. It's never been done. He isn't dead, hollered Zuckerman. He's fainted. He gets embarrassed easily. Run for some water, Lurvy. Lurvy sprang from the judge's ring and disappeared. Templeton poked his head from the straw. He noticed that the end of Wilbur's tail was in reach. Templeton grinned. I'll tend to this, he chuckled. He took Wilbur's tail in his mouth and bit it just as hard as he could bite. The pain revived Wilbur. In a flash, he was back on his feet. Ouch, he screamed. Hooray, yelled the crowd. He's up. The pig is up. Good work, Zuckerman. Some pig. Everyone was delighted. Mr. Zuckerman was the most pleased of them all. He sighed with relief. Nobody had seen Templeton. The rat had done his work well. And now one of the judges climbed into the ring with the prizes. He handed Mr. Zuckerman two $10 bills and a $5 bill. Then he tied the medal around Wilbur's neck. Then he shook hands with Mr. Zuckerman while Wilbur blushed. Avery put out his hand and the judges shook hands with him too. The crowd cheered. A photographer took Wilbur's picture. A great feeling of happiness swept over Zuckerman's, the Zuckermans and the Arables. This was a great moment in Mr. Zuckerman's life. It was deeply satisfying to win a prize in front of a lot of people. As Wilbur was beginning, as Wilbur was being shoved back into the crate, Lurvy came charging through the crowd, carrying a pail of water. His eyes had a wild look. Without hesitation, he dashed the water at Wilbur. In his excitement, he missed his aim, and the water splashed all over Mr. Zuckerman and Avery. They got soaking wet. For goodness sakes, bellowed Mr. Zuckerman who was really drenched. What ails you, Lurvy? Can't you see the pig is all right? You asked for water, said Lurvy weakly. I didn't ask for a shower bath, said Mr. Zuckerman. The crowd roared with laughter. Finally, Mr. Zuckerman had to laugh too. And of course, Avery was tickled to find himself so wet. He immediately started to act like a clown. He pretended he was talking, taking a shower bath. He made faces and danced around and rubbed imaginary soap under his armpits. Then he dried himself with an imaginary towel. Avery, stop it, cried his mother. Stop showing off. But the crowd loved it. Avery heard nothing but applause. He liked being the clown in a ring with everybody watching in front of the grandstand. When he discovered there was still a little water left at the bottom of the pail, he raised the pail high in the air and dumped the water on himself and made faces. The children in the the grandstand screamed with appreciation. At last, things calmed down. Wilbur was loaded into the truck. Avery was led from the ring by his mother and placed on a seat in the truck to dry off. The truck, driven by Mr. Arable, crawled slowly back to the pig pen. Avery's wet trousers made a big wet spot on the seat. All right, we just have two chapters left, so I think we're just going to have an extra long video today and finish. Chapter 21, Last Day. Charlotte and Wilbur were alone. The families had gone to look for Fern. Templeton was asleep. Wilbur lay resting after the excitement and strain of the ceremony. His medal still hung from his neck. By looking out of the corner of his eyes, he could see it. Charlotte, said Wilbur after a while, why are you so quiet? I like to sit still, she said. I've always been rather quiet. Yes, but you seem specially so today. Do you feel all right? A little tired, perhaps, but I feel peaceful. Your success in the ring this morning was, to a small degree, my success. Your future is assured. 
You will live secure and safe, Wilbur. Nothing can harm you now. These autumn days will shorten and grow cold. The leaves will shake loose from the trees this fall. Christmas will come and then snows of winter. You will live to enjoy the beauty of the frozen world. For you mean a great deal to Zuckerman and he will not harm you ever. Winter will pass, the days will lengthen, the ice will melt in the pasture pond. The song sparrow will return and sing, the frogs will awake, the warm winds will blow again. All these sights and sounds and smells will be yours to enjoy. Wilbur, this lovely world, these precious days. Charlotte stopped. A moment later, a tear came to Wilbur's eye. Oh, Charlotte, he said, to think that when I first met you, I thought you were cruel and bloodthirsty. When he recovered from his emotion, he spoke again. Why did you do all this for me? He asked. I don't deserve it. I've never done anything for you. You have been my friend, replied Charlotte. That in itself is a tremendous thing. I wove my webs for you because I liked you. After all, what's a life anyways? We're born, we live a little, we die. A spider's life can't help being something of a mess with all this trapping and eating flies. By helping you, perhaps I was trying to lift up my little life a trifle. Heaven knows anyone's life can stand a little of that. Well, said Wilbur, I'm no good at making speeches. I haven't got your gift for words, but you have saved me, Charlotte, and I would gladly give my life for you. I really would. I'm sure you would, and I thank you for your generous sentiments. Charlotte, said Wilbur, we're all going home today. The fair is almost over. Won't it be wonderful to be back home in the barn cellar again with the sheep and the geese? Aren't you anxious to get home? For a moment, Charlotte said nothing. Then she spoke in a low voice. Wilbur could hardly hear the words. I will not be going back to the barn, she said. Wilbur leapt to his feet. Not going back, he cried. Charlotte, what are you talking about? I'm done for, she replied. In a day or two, I'll be dead. I haven't even the strength to climb down into the crate. I doubt if I have enough silk in my spinnerets to lower me to the ground. Hearing this, Wilbur threw himself down in the agony of pain and sorrow. Great sobs racked his body. He heaved and grunted with desolation. Charlotte, he moaned, Charlotte, my true friend. Come now, let's not make a scene, said the spider. Be quiet, Wilbur, stop thrashing around. But I can't stand it, shouted Wilbur. I won't leave you here all alone to die. If you're going to stay here, I shall too. Don't be ridiculous, said Charlotte. You can't stay here. Zuckerman and Lurvy and John Arable and the others will be back any minute now, and they'll shove you into the crate and away you'll go. Besides, it wouldn't make any sense for you to stay. There would be no one to feed you. The fairgrounds will soon be empty and deserted. Wilbur was in a panic. He raced round and round the pen. Suddenly he had an idea. He thought of the egg sack and the 514 little spiders that would hatch in the spring. If Charlotte herself was unable to go home to the barn, at least he must take her children along. Wilbur rushed to the front of his pen. He put his feet up on top of the boards and gazed around. In the distance he saw the Arables and Zuckermans approaching. He knew he would have to act quickly. Where's Templeton, he demanded. He's in the corner under the straw asleep, said Charlotte. Wilbur rushed over, pushed his strong snout under the rat and tossed him into the air. Templeton, screamed Wilbur, pay attention. The rat, the rat, surprised out of a sound sleep, looked first dazed, then disgusting. What kind of monkey, sh monkey shine is this, he growled. Can't a rat catch a wink of sleep without being rudely popped into the air? Listen to me, cried Wilbur. Charlotte is very ill. She only has a short time to live. She cannot accompany us home because of her condition. Therefore, it is absolutely necessary that I take her egg sack with me. I can't reach it. I can't climb. You're the only one that can get it. There's not a second to be lost. The people are coming. They'll be here in no time. Please, 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 Templeton, climb up and get the egg sack. The rat yawned. He straightened his whiskers. Then he looked up at the egg sack. So, he said in disgust, so it's old Templeton to the rescue again. Templeton, do this. Templeton, do that. Templeton, please run down to the dump and get me a magazine clipping. Templeton, please lend me a piece of string so I can spin a web. Oh, hurry, said Wilbur. Hurry up, Templeton. But the rat was in no hurry. He began intimidating Wilbur's voice. So it's hurry up, Templeton, is it? He said. 
Ho, ho. And what thanks do I ever get for these services? I would like to know. Never a kind word for old Templeton. Only abuse and wisecracks and side remarks. Never a kind word for a rat. Templeton, said Wilbur in desperation, if you don't stop talking and get busy, all will be lost, and I will die of a broken heart. Please climb up. Templeton lay back in the straw. Lazily, he paced his forepaws behind his head and crossed his knees in an attitude of complete relaxation. Die of a broken heart, he mimicked. How touching. My, my, I notice that it's always me you come to when in trouble, but I've never heard anyone's heart breaking on my account. Oh, no. Who cares anything about old Templeton? Get up, screamed Wilbur. Stop acting like a spoiled child. Templeton grinned and lay still. Who made the trip after trip to the dump, he asked. Why is, why, it was old Templeton. Who saved Charlotte's life by scaring that arable boy away from the rotten goose egg? Bless my soul, I believe it was old Templeton. Who bit your tail and got you back on your feet this morning after you fainted in front of the crowd? Old Templeton, has it ever occurred to you that I'm sick of running errands and doing favors? What do you think I am, anyway? A rat of all work? Wilbur was desperate. People were coming. The rat was failing him. Suddenly he remembered Templeton's fondness for food. Templeton, he said, I will make you a solemn promise. Get Charlotte's egg sack for me, and from now on I will let you eat first when Lurvy slops me. I will let you have your choice of everything in the trough. I won't touch a thing until you're through. The rat sat up. W Do you mean that? He said. I promise. I cross my heart. All right, it's a deal, said the rat. He walked to the wall and started to climb. His stomach was still swollen from last night's gorge. Groaning and complaining, he pulled himself up slowly to the ceiling. He crept along till he reached the egg sack. Charlotte moved aside for him. She was dying, but she still had enough strength to move a little. Then Templeton bared his long, ugly teeth and began snipping the threads and fastening the sack that fastened the sack to the ceiling. Wilbur watched from below. Use extreme care, he said. I don't want a single one of those eggs harmed. Fifth of six in my mouth, complained the rat. Sort of worse than camel corn. But Templeton worked away at the job and managed to cut the sack adrift and carry it to the ground, where he dropped it in front of Wilbur. Wilbur heaved a great sigh of relief. Thank you, Templeton, he said. I will never forget this as long as I live. Neither will I, said the rat, picking his teeth. I feel as though I've eaten a spoon, a spool of thread. Well, home we go. Templeton crept in the crate and buried himself in the straw. He got out of sight just in time. Lurvy and John Arable and Mr. Zuckerman came along at that moment, followed by Mrs. Arable and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery and Fern. Wilbur had already decided how he would carry the egg sack. There was only one possible way. He carefully took the little bundle in his mouth and he held it there on top of his tongue. He remembered what Charlotte had told him, that the sack was waterproof and strong. It felt funny on his tongue and made him drool a bit. And of course he couldn't say anything, but he was being shoved into a crate he looked up at Charlotte and gave her a wink. She knew he was saying goodbye in the only way he could, and she knew her children would be safe. Goodbye, she whispered. Then she summoned all her strength and waved from her front legs to him. She never moved again. Next day, as the Ferris wheel was being taken apart and the racehorses were being loaded into vans and the entertainers were packing up their belongings and driving away in their trailers, Charlotte died. The fairgrounds were soon deserted, the sheds and buildings were empty and forlorn. The infield was littered with bottles and trash. Nobody of the hundreds of people that had visited the fair knew that the gray spider had played the most important part of all. No one was with her when she died. All right, last chapter. Chapter 22, A Warm Wind. And so Wilbur came home to his beloved manure pile in the barn cellar. He was a, it, his was a strange homecoming. Around his neck he wore a medal of honor. In his mouth he held a sack of spiders' eggs. There was no place like home, Wilbur thought, as he placed Charlotte's 514 unborn children carefully in the safe corner. The barn smelled good. His friends, the sheep and the geese, were glad to see him back. The geese gave him a noisy welcome. Congratu congratu congratulations, they cried. Nice work. Mr. Zuckerman took the medal from Wilbur's neck and hung it on the nail over the pig pen where visitors could examine it. 
Wilbur himself could look at it whenever he wanted to. In the days that followed, he was very happy. He grew to great size. He no longer worried about being killed, for he knew Mr. Zuckerman would keep him as long as he lived. Wilbur often thought of Charlotte, the few strands of her old web still strung in the doorway. Every day, Wilbur would stand and look at the torn, empty web, and a lump would come into his throat. No one had, no one had ever had such a friend, so affectionate, so loyal, and so skillful. The autumn days grew short. Lurvy brought the squashes and pumpkins in from the garden and piled them on the barn floor, where they wouldn't get nipped on frosty nights. The maples and birches turned bright colors, and the wind shook them, and they dropped their leaves one by one to the ground. Under the wild apple trees in the pastures, the red little apples lay thick on the ground, and the sheep gnawed them, and the geese gnawed them, and the foxes came in the night and sniffed them. One evening, just before Christmas, snow began to fall. It covered the house and barn and fields and woods. Phil Wilbur had never seen snow before. When morning came, he went out and plop plowed the drifts in his yard for a little fun. Fern and Avery arrived dragging a sled. They coasted down the lane and out onto the frozen pond of the pasture. Coasting is the most fun there is, said Avery. The most fun there is, reported Fern, is when the Ferris wheel stops and Henry and I are in the top car and Henry makes the car swing and we can see everything for miles and miles and miles. Goodness, are you still thinking about that old Ferris wheel, said Avery in disgust. The fair was weeks and weeks ago. I think about it all the time, said Fern, picking snow from her ears. After Christmas, the thermometer dropped to ten below zero. Cold settled on the world. The pasture was bleak and frozen. The cows stayed in the barn all the time now, except on sunny mornings when they went out and stood in the barnyard in the lee of the straw pile. The sheep stayed near the barn, too, for protection. When they were thirsty, they ate snow. The geese hung around the barnyard the way boys hang out around a drugstore, and Mr. Zuckerman fed them corn and turnips to keep them cheerful. Many, many, many thanks, they always said when they saw food coming. Templeton moved indoors when winter came. His ratty home under the pig trough was too chilly, so he fixed himself a cozy nest in the barn behind the grain bins. He lined it with bits of dirty newspaper and rags, and whenever he found a trinket or a keepsake, he carried it home and stored it there. He continued to visit Wilbur three times a day, exactly at mealtime, and Wilbur kept the promise he had made. Wilbur let the rat eat first. Then, when Templeton couldn't hold another mouthful, Wilbur would eat. As a result of overeating, as a result of overeating, Templeton grew bigger and fatter than any rat you'd ever saw. He was gigantic. He was as big as a young woodchuck. The old sheep spoke to him one day about his size. "You would live longer," said the sheep, "if you ate less." "Who wants to live forever?" sneered the rat. "I am naturally a heavy eater, and I get untold satisfaction from the pleasures of the feast." He patted his stomach and grinned at the sheep and crept upstairs to lie down. All winter, Wilbur watched over Charlotte's egg sack as if he were guarding his own children. He had scooped out a special place in the manure for the sack next to the board fence. On very cold nights, he laid so that his breath would warm it. For Wilbur, nothing in life was so important as this round object. Nothing else mattered. Patiently, he awaited the end of the winter and the coming of little spiders. Life is always rich and steady time when you are waiting for something to happen or to hatch. The winter ended at last. I heard the frogs today, said the old sheep one evening. Listen, you can hear them now. Wilbur, still, Wilbur stood still and cocked his ears. From the pond, in shrill of chorus, came the voices of hundreds of little frogs. Springtime, said the old sheep thoughtfully. Another spring. As she walked away, Wilbur saw a new lamb following her. It was only a few hours old. The snows melted and ran away. The streams and ditches bubbled and chattered with rushing water. A sparrow with a streaky breast arrived and sang. The light strengthened. The mornings came sooner. Almost every morning there was another new lamb in the sheepfold. The goose was sitting on nine eggs. The sky seemed wider and a warm wind blew. The last remaining strands of Charlotte's old, old web floated away and vanished. One fine sunny morning after breakfast, Wilbur stood watching his precious sack. He wasn't thinking of anything much. As he stood there, he noticed something move. He stepped closer and stared. A tiny spider crawled from the sack. It was no bigger than a grain of sand. 
no bigger than the head of a pin. Its body was gray with a black stripe underneath. Its legs were gray and tan. It looked just like Charlotte. Wilbur trembled all over when he saw it. The little spider waved to him. Then Wilbur looked more closely. Two more little spiders crawled out and waved. They climbed round and round the sack, exploring their new world. Then three more little spiders, then eight, then ten. Charlotte's children were here at last. Wilbur's heart pounded. He began to squeal. Then he raced in circles, kicking manure into air. When he turned a backflip, then he planted his front feet and came to a stop in front of Charlotte's children. Hello there, he said. The first spider said hello, but its voice was so small Wilbur couldn't hear it. I am your old I am an old friend of your mother's, said Wilbur. I am glad to see you. Are you all right? Is everything all right? The little spiders waved their forelegs at him. Wilbur could see by the way they acted that they were glad to see him. Is there anything I can get you? Is there anything you need? The young spiders just waved. For several days and several nights, they crawled here and there, up and down, around and around, waving at Wilbur, trailing tiny drag lines behind them and exploring their home. There were dozens and dozens of them. Wilbur couldn't count them, but he knew he had a great many new friends. He grew rapid. He grew quite rapidly, or they grew quite rapidly. Excuse me. Soon each was as big as a BB shot. They made tiny webs near the sack. Then came a quiet morning when Mr. Zuckerman opened the door on the north side. A warm draft of rising air blew so softly through the barn cellar. The air smelled of damp earth, of the spruce wood, of the sweet springtime. The baby spiders felt the warmth up draft. One spider climbed to the top of the fence when it did something that came to a great surprise to Wilbur. The spider stood on its head, pointed its spinnerets in the air, and let loose a cloud of fine silk. The silk formed a balloon. As Wilbur watched, the, spilber, the spider let go of the fence and rose into the air. Goodbye, it said as it sailed through the doorway. Wait a minute, screamed Wilbur. Where do you think you're going? But the spider was already out of sight. Then another baby spider crawled to the top of the fence and stood on its head, made a balloon, and sailed away. Then another spider, then another. The air was soon filled with tiny balloons, each balloon carrying a spider. Wilbur was frantic. Charlotte's babies were disappearing at a great rate. Come back, children, he cried. Goodbye, they called. Goodbye, goodbye. At last, one little spider took time enough to stop and talk to Wilbur before making its balloon. We're leaving here on a warm updraft. This is our moment for setting forth. We're aeronauts, and we are going into the world to make webs of our, for ourselves. But where, asked Wilbur, wherever the wind takes us, high, low, near, far, east, west, north, south, we'll take the breeze. We go as we please. You're all going, all of you, asked Wilbur. You can't all go. I would be left alone with no friends. Your mother wouldn't want that to happen, I'm sure. The air was now so full of balloons that the barn cellar looked almost as though the mist had gathered. Balloons by the dozen were rising, circling, and drifting away through the door, sailing off on a gentle wind. Cries of goodbye, goodbye, goodbye came weakly to Wilbur's ears. He couldn't bear to watch it any more. In sorrow, he sank to the ground and closed his eyes. This seemed like the end of the world to be deserted by Charlotte's children. Wilbur cried himself to sleep. When he woke up in the late afternoon, he looked at the egg sack. It was empty. He looked into the air. The balloonists were gone. Then he walked drearily to the doorway where Charlotte's web used to be. He was standing there, thinking of her, when he heard a small voice. Salutations, it said. I'm up here. So am I, said another tiny voice. So am I, said a third voice. Three of us are staying. We like this place, and we like you. Wilbur looked up at the top of the doorway. Three small webs were being constructed. On each web, working busily, was one of Charlotte's daughters. Can I take this to mean, asked Wilbur, that you have definitely decided to live here in the barn cellar and that I'm going to have three friends? You can indeed, said the spiders. What are your names, please, asked Wilbur, trembling with joy. I'll tell you my name, replied the first little spider, if you tell me why you're trembling. I'm trembling with joy, said Wilbur. Then my name is Joy, said the first spider. What was my mother's middle initial, asked the second spider. A, said Wilbur. Then my name is Arania, said the spider. 
How about me? asked the third spider. Will you just pick out a nice sensible name for me? Something not too long, not too fancy, and not too silly? Wilbur thought hard. Nellie, he suggested. Fine, I like it very much, said the third spider. You may call me Nellie. She daintily fastened her orb line to the next spoke of the web. Wilbur's heart brimmed with happiness. He felt that he should make a short speech on this very important occasion. Joy, Arania, Nellie, he began, welcome to the barn center. You have cho welcome to the barn cellar. You have chosen a hollow doorway from which to string your webs. I think it's only fair to tell you that I was devoted to your mother. I owe my very life to her. She was brilliant, beautiful, and loyal to the end. I shall always treat her treasure her memory. To you, her daughters, I pledge my friendship forever and ever. I pledge mine, said Joy. I do too, said Arania. And so do I, said Nellie, who had just managed to catch a small gnat. It was a happy day for Wilbur, and many more happy, tranquil days followed. As time went on, as the months and years came and went, he was never without friends. Fern did not come regularly to the barn anymore. She was growing up and was careful to avoid childish things like sitting on a milk stool near a pig pen. But Charlotte's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren year after year lived in the doorway. Each spring there were new little spiders hatching out to take the place of the old. Most of them sailed away on their balloons, but always two or three of them stayed and set up housekeeping in the doorway. Mr. Zuckerman took fine care of Wilbur all the rest of his days, and the pig was often visited by friends and admirers, for nobody ever forgot the year of his triumph and the miracle of his web. Life in the barn was very good, day and night, winter, spring, fall, and summer, dull days and bright days. It was the best place to be, thought Wilbur. This warm, delicious cellar with the garrulous geese, the changing seasons, the heat of the sun, and the passage of swallows, the nearness of rats, the sameness of sheep, the love of spiders, the smell of manure, and the glory of everything. Wilbur never forgot Charlotte, although she loved her children and grandchildren dearly. None of the new spiders ever quite took her place in his heart. She was in a class of herself. It was not often that someone comes along who is a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. The end. All right, well, I apologize for the longer than normal read aloud today, but I wanted to finish the book before the end of the weekend. If you are participating in our summer reading program, you can go ahead and write down 60 minutes for the day. We'll give you a few extra bonus minutes for making it this long into the video. Uh, also, if you are participating with our program via the Beanstack app, you can go ahead and enter uh, terrific into the have you heard badge and earn that badge if you haven't earned it already again that word is terrific t-e-r-r-i-f-i-c terrific all right well i'll be back on monday next week with a new book i hope you all have a fantastic weekend and we'll see you next week bye